It's 1232. Um, Hi everybody, welcome to the first Sensi Lab Forum live for quite some time. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Simon Penny, um, who's visiting from the US. Um, Simon's a distinguished academic, artist, researcher, theorist, critic, curator, um, jack of all trades. Really. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's um, great pleasure to welcome him here. And he's only got half an hour to speak, uh, but we'll have time for questions at the end. And continue the discussion hopefully um, and there's some food if you're here live there's some food outside if you're not I'm sure you can you can be eating if you're online um, so thank you Simon welcome and really keen to hear what you've got to say oh lovely well thanks thanks John it's a real pleasure to be here and thank you for your welcome and hello to everyone online I'm not quite sure where the camera is right now but presumably I'm on camera um, uh, yeah hello to everyone online and as I say it's a, a real pleasure to be here um, this talk I've retitled today um, uh, uh, Proprioception and Skill, a Neurophilosophy of Reflective Practice. Um, the first part of the talk is on that subject. I will pause before the second half of the talk to field questions and then we'll see if we're going to go on with the second half of the talk. Um, so, um, my uh, current research is into um, skilled artisanal knowledge. Um, I'm not, I should say, formally trained as an anthropologist, psychologist, sociologist or philosopher. I went to art school. Um, I, I seem to have become an academic, but I was not trained as an academic. And I want to emphasize that my approach to these subjects while I draw upon um, scientific and scholarly research, is deeply grounded in a lifetime of skilled practices and reflection on such practices. I have a lifelong history of uh, hands-on practice as a sculptor, designer, sailor, boat builder, welder, blacksmith, um, electronics technician, roboticist, and other, other practices. So, um, emphatically, the motivation for this work arises out of practice, out of questions that have emerged for me in the process of working in diverse materials and tools, always with attention to the development of skills, sensibilities, and judgments, and the nature of failures. Um, so, my current study circulates around several key concepts that arise in what are called the, the 4E or post-cognitivist schools of cognition. And some of these concepts that I'll be talking about today include the idea of know-how, which comes from the philosopher Gilbert Ryle. The notion of the performative idiom comes from Andy Pickering. Uh, proprioception as an area of, of a primary area of concern. Um, the notion of pre-reflective awareness, uh, epistemic action, and the, the idea of cognitive ecologies, and also, I should say, the idea of the offloading of cognition into structured environments is um, central to the second part of the talk. But now, um, I want to provide an autoethnographic vignette, which I have chosen specifically because it's not encumbered with any uh, um, cultural, uh, valorized cultural practices. And this is about painting my garage door. I recently repainted my garage door. It was badly weathered, the paint was flaking, and after the necessary scraping and filling and sanding, I applied uh, two coats of oil-based undercoat and two coats of alkyd enamel. The undercoat went on reasonably uneventfully, though I had to carefully add various kinds of thinners and extenders 
to facilitate the process of application, minimising overbrushing and maximising coverage. I used two brushes, one large and one small, for the edges and details. Applying the first coat of gloss enamel was more complex. The paint out of the can was viscous and gluey. I decanted some, always a messy process. Thinners and brushing additive were added in carefully judged amounts to make the application of the paint a satisfactory experience. But what constitutes a satisfactory experience here? That perhaps an appropriately loaded paintbrush can be brought to the surface without dripping, that the paint is applied through the brush stroke in a way that produces an even application without thin spots, without drips, for as large an area as possible um, within uh, one brush stroke. It's inefficient to drag a drying out brush across the surface and it's inefficient to apply pressure from the brush to squeeze extra paint out of the brush. But a fully loaded brush behaves differently from a partially loaded brush. So one develops a kind of bodily um, vernacular with, with this particular kind of paint, this particular kind of brush, this particular kind of surface in these particular weather conditions. So in this case, because of the viscosity of the paint, I, I developed a kind of what I call a dumping and spreading technique where I'd like put down a stroke, turn the brush over where the brush was still full of paint and put down a stroke downwards and then use sideways strokes to, to spread the paint in a kind of ergonomically or biomechanically efficient process that was developed you know, as, as one goes. Now the length of these vertical patches was in part determined by the amount of paint on the brush and the, and the friction of the surface and also um, to do with the biomechanics of, of, of my movement. You know, I didn't want to bend down to finish a stroke. And as a result, the painting of the door happened in roughly in four horizontal bands while I was lying on the ground, kneeling on the ground, standing, and standing on a small stepladder. Then there's the matter of the edges and details, which you can't paint with the big brush. So you have to use a smaller brush. But once you're using the smaller brush, the problem of the so-called wet edge comes into play. When you're painting an area, when you come back to join an area of paint to that paint, if that paint is already dried, you get problematic kind of pulling and, and, and uh, as, as you try and paint onto this semi-dry paint. And of course, when you're using two brushes, you might be concerned that the brush you're not using is getting dried out. Because a, a paint with half dry, uh, a brush with half dry paint on it is very problematic and you have to take it to the thinners and, 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 and uh, clean it out again. So, I worked with a number of different kinds of brushes in, in this job. And the brushes that were uh, appropriate for the applying of the undercoat um, were not appropriate for the applying of the of the um, of the gloss paint because the gloss paint was so much more viscous. Imagine trying to paint honey with a brush made of human hair. Control was very difficult. So the 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 mechanical qualities of the bristles of the brush. Uh, uh, had to be had to be uh, appropriate to the to the particular paint that was being used. Now I'm talking about applying paint to a vertical surface, but of course applying paint to a horizontal surface, a whole different set of rules apply, um, uh, conditions apply, and of course the way the painting process occurs is also specific to the weather. If I was painting on a surface that was exposed to the sun or in hot weather, 
the uh, solvents would evaporate off the paint faster and therefore it would become viscous faster and so I have to monitor the different amounts of thinners and, and extenders that I might be using. Painting. Other sorts of things like a stool like this presents a whole different set of subtle sort of bodily uh, learning. Now, paint itself is remarkable stuff, right? Applied as a liquid, it forms a paper-thin solid coating, so densely filled with pigment that it is opaque. Remarkable. It's a complex chemical product. It produces a tough, thin, hard, waterproof surface, paper-thin. But also one of the qualities of a good paint is that it is handleable. It is compatible with the brush and the qualities of human movement. Imagine if the paint were like porridge. The process would be completely unsatisfactory. No one would buy that sort of paint. So there's a, there's a way that the materiality of the paint has been conformed to the capacities of people and tool use. So the reason I labor this example, which is trivial and, and some people might be rolling their eyes about, and I could go on longer, right, is to draw out um, that, that there's so much sensitivity and so much knowledge uh, and and moment to moment improvisation and a adaptation to local conditions, to the specifics of the materials and the site and so on, just to apply a surface paint, you know, to a vertical flat surface. And the question I have is how are we to ex assess the cognitive dimensions of this task? It's filled with decisive intelligent uh, Intelligence seems incommensurable with the qualities we generally associate with the concepts of intelligence in an abstract sense. So this is my quarry in the research, one of the, my sort of philosophical quarry in, in the research that I'm doing right now is to really question the distinction between skill and intelligence as it's understood in, in psychology and in theories of cognition. And of course, as a practitioner, this is important to me, right? And as those of you who are makers and practitioners, if you are reflective to any degree about your practice, then you've probably asked yourself these kinds of questions. How does my adept ability to manipulate the world in complex and sophisticated ways that constitutes expertise, how does that tally with more abstract notions of intelligence, such as are valorized in institutions like universities. So that, that's sort of what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of driving at here. Now Gilbert Ryle, as I mentioned, um, he would have no, um, no quibble with this. You know, as he said back in the 1940s, um, he, he, um, overt uh, intelligent performances are not clues to the workings of minds, they are those workings. So Gilbert Ryle, in the context of Oxford um, analytic philosophical school really um, challenged the prevailing order um, and, and um, went on to say the traditional theory of mind has misconstrued the type distinction between disposition and exercise into a mythical bifurcation of unwitnessable mental causes and their witnessable physical effects. And he went on in this vein to say, thinking what I am doing does not connote both thinking what to do and doing it. When I do something intelligently, i.e. thinking what I am doing, I'm doing one thing and not two. My performance has a special procedure or manner, not special antecedents. And this idea of special antecedents, I think, is really important, um, particularly, you know, perhaps with this audience, when thinking about questions of design. Because design as a discipline seems to have embraced the idea that creative action must be preceded by creative thought. And this is something that, that Tim Ingold 
relatively recently has referred to as hylomorphism, using an Aristotelian idea, uh, some people say incorrectly. Um, but essentially the idea is, as you'll be most familiar, right, is that is this notion that you can, if you're going to design a building, you know, you, you, you have the concept first and then you realize the concept in some sort of material form. Now, many dimensions of, or, or many areas of artisanal and maker practice and artistic practice will, will, will dispute, excuse me, this, um, this idea, right? And, and in the, in the studio arts, for sure, there's an emphasis on process, on, on the engagement with the materials and procedures and with an open kind of exploration. And that there's an acceptance that the notion of, of creativity happens in the doing and is not sort of overlaid onto matter by mind. And of course, you know, this notion of mind coming first and then material manipulation coming second is a classic kind of uh, uh, aspect of the Cartesian mind-body dualism, as is the distinction between skill and intelligence. So these concepts uh, uh, go, go back to sort of en enlightenment philosophical axiomatic assumptions, which much of the embodied and inactive cognition uh, work disputes. So this is a kind of, you know, if you want to look at it in a big field of of uh, history of ideas, um, the, then, the, then the embodied and inactive cognition movements are certainly part of a kind of post-humanism, um, disputing some of the fundamental precepts of humanism and all of those binaries that, that are so uh, uh, integrated into our culture, like subject, object, mind, body, and as Dan and I were discussing earlier, um, the human exceptionalism, mm -hmm. humans and animals, conscious, unconscious, all of these uh, binaries, exclusive binaries, are, are up for question. Um, so, Andy Pickering is another theorist who's talked about this sort of thing in a slightly different way. Um, wrote a terrific book on the sociology of science called The Mangle of Practice, which I would encourage uh, you to read. Um, but he distinguishes something he called the performative idiom from something he called the representational idiom. Now, he was talking about scientific research in the main, but I found these ideas very useful in thinking about creative practice of different sorts. Um, and this idea has... Um, has, has associations with, you might be familiar with actor network theory. Um, uh, although, so he was affiliated with those people but wouldn't really class himself as an ANT person. Um, but his idea was essentially that, that in the process of academic processing, the world is turned into symbolic representations of the world. So the kind of chaos and mess of the lab or the chemistry lab or whatever it happens to be, you know, where there are accidents and, uh, um, and so on and negotiations with, with, with um, equipment, artifacts and, 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 and um, you know, biological samples and so on. He refers to that as, a, as, as the performative idiom and he describes the behaviour in that area as, as being a dance of agency, which is very much like the actor network theory notion of interaction between actants or agents. Um, an ongoing fluid temporal engagement that resists formulation in terms of propositional knowledge. And then that knowledge in the academy is kind of squeezed into a, into a flow of symbols, you know, in papers like this or reports of experiments or equations or so on. Right? And that's what he calls the representational idiom. Now, interestingly, Dwight Eisenhower, who's not usually regarded as a cognitive scientist, said something that, was, you know, that I think is very sympathetic. He said, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Um, so the argument that, that I, I'm interested in making here is that um, to the extent that we are embodied sensing creatures, cognition quite clearly occurs in the world. 
any maker knows this viscerally, like any of us who are skilled at doing things, whether I'm um, drilling into steel at the drill press or chopping onions at the chopping board, my intelligence is not, as it were, in a velvet seat in the darkness of the Cartesian theatre. It's there on the bench, in the peripersonal space at the nexus of hand and tool, where my focused, fully stereoscopic gaze wraps itself around the hand, gripping the onion, uh, and the hand, as it were, basks in the warmth of the gaze. Now, as embodied, situated creatures, we know ourselves and the world through our embodiment. And as Jakob von Erkskull showed us, um, the kind of experiential world we have, which he called our Umwelt, is given to us by the particular suite of senses we have and our embodiment more generally. You know, um, bats uh, feel the physical space that they're in through a, the reflection of a of an, uh, of, a, uh, of an emitted sound. We don't know how to do that. Some blind people do, actually. There's a whole echolocation thing going on. Um, uh, dogs have uh, an olfactory world that we can't comprehend. So these different kinds of people, these different kinds of animals, can share the same physical space and yet have different umwelts. The umwelt we have is given to us by our embodiment and our skills. There is no, we have no access to a, to a objective world. Now, I want to move to talking about sensory experience and, and proprioception here. So according to a cognitivist notion of cognition, our senses hoover up facts about the world and vision, the paragon, uh, enlightenment sense is most like this. The remote sensing via an inscrutable electrophysical medium. And we can extrapolate this analogy to, to hearing, but after that, things get a whole lot more fleshier and a whole lot messier. A myriad of sensations fall under the category of touch, texture, pressure, temperature, some kinds of pain. And as we know, classical philosophy identifies five senses. But my argument is that it has been unable to recognize a fundamental bodily sense which undergirds and structures these named five senses of classical philosophy. So what do we know or learn when we say, hold, pick up a brick? We sense a rough texture, perhaps, and it notably, we only sense texture in movement, right? When movement stops, texture stops. And in fact, this is the case for many senses. Sensing is temporal. What we, f what we perceive are differences, deltas. Sensing at this micro level always entails action, bearing out the inactive sensory motor conception that rejects the sense act dualism. Now, the other qualities of the brick, its mass, its balance in your grip, the force you have to keep uh, to apply, to, to keep the grip, the way you adjust your stance to accommodate its mass, the posture, the changing dynamics of the posture as you heave it through the adjacent window. Um, all these sensations arise below the skin, deep in the muscles and joints, or m perhaps more accurately in the fascia, in which there are 250 million nerve endings. More nerve endings in the superficial fascia than are in the skin itself. And this, since we're techy kind of people in this room, it occurs to me that this is one of those reasons why those arguments for embodied robotics just isn't going to happen for a long time. You know. When will we have robotic technology that has 250 million internal nerve endings? It just ain't going to happen, you know, not for a very long time. Um, now, this temporally continuous awareness of the shape of our body and the forces that are acting on our body is what we call proprioception. 
and proprioception is given by this neurostructural network of nerve endings in fascia. It's the sense, of course, that allows us, with our eyes closed, to put our fingertips together. Right? Um, now, we should distinguish proprioception from other internal sensing qualities such as interoception, nociception, that's the sense of pain, graviception, the vestibular sense. So in, in a way, once we start to explore these different qualities of sensing or being aware, the whole definition of what a sense is, is brought into question. Right? So some people have referred to at the, as the, of, uh, re referred to the fascia as its own sensing organ, and, and in some cases people refer to it as the organ of form which is rather intriguing concept. Now, as I said, it's my opinion that proprioception undergirds all the other senses. And let me give you an example. Right? I can do this, you know, I can, I can do that, and I don't fall over. And I don't feel like the world is flying around me like this. Right? Why is that? Because vision is not just about what's happening with the eyes. Vision is integrating a knowledge of the fact that the stalk that my eyes are on is moving with respect to my body. And so there's a constant integration of graviception, balance, and, and the visual signals, right? Which make up, which help me make sense of vision. Now this goes right back into animal develop and human development. There's a great, really amusing experiment by, famous experiment by Hein and Held, you might know of it, called the Kittens in Baskets experiment. And in this experiment, are two classes of kittens called P and A for some reason. Um, and these kittens were taken at the point where their eyes were opening and they were kept in the dark unless they were in this experimental rig. The rig is so constructed that the the walking kitten drives the kitten pee around, right? And there are one class of kittens get to be A and another class of kittens get to be P. And so the two kittens have an identical visual experience at the end of the experimental period. The kittens A are functionally normal. The kittens P are blind, functionally blind. Why? Because their visual system has not been calibrated by their understanding of physical movement. Now, this also happens in child development, right? Infants throw their arms around, you know, this is why we dangle the, the, the rattles and things across the crib, right? You bang it, it makes a noise, that means Whatever that visual experience is, is an arm's length away from me. Right? Something I can kick, so I learn about the, the dimensions of my body, my bodily capabilities, and those, that, that experience brings me into stereoscopic vision. Now, some of you may have seen images like this. This is a uh, sculpture of Penfield's homunculus. I'm not sure, in fact, if this is the so-called motor homunculus or the, or the sensory homunculus, but he mapped, that basically represents brain real estate that relates to the motor functions or the, or the tactile sensing of these particular parts of the body. I was looking at this and I was thinking, that's interesting, isn't it? Because if this is the motor homunculus, then areas of bodily touch are not exactly the corollary of the motor homunculus. And yet, I could find no reference to something we might call the proprioceptive homunculus in the neurophysiological literature. So there's a kind of disjunction between these two things, which may point to a 
even in in the sort of process of of, of research into neurophysiological uh, in, in neurophysiology, um, a lack of recognition of the significance of proprioception. So. The reason I'm talking all about this is that I'm trying to understand what does it mean to acquire a skill. Now, you, we will have noticed, right, we have a sophisticated vocabulary for the visual, the auditory, the olfactory, um, but outside of practitioners of specialized body practices such as yoga, tai chi, martial arts, dance, etc., most people cannot speak of embodied awarenesses with much precision or eloquence. That's an interesting observation because once again it kind of points to where we've been taught to uh, pay, uh, pay attention in terms of our bodily experience and, and, and what, what areas we might have ignored. Now, some philosophers, or philosophers of cognition, Susan Hurley, Dorothea Legrand, Sean Gallagher, use, this, use a concept that they call pre-reflective awareness. So pre-reflective awareness is one's awareness of embodiment prior to internal narration. And um, my uh, argument would be, well, look at that. Well, first of all, my argument is that proprioception is the sense that makes the other senses make sense. But furthermore, talking about pre-reflective awareness, I would propose that proprioception is the source of pre-reflective awareness and that enskillment, the process of in, 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 of in, in skillment uh, consists in Making, finding access to previously in, uh, consciously inaccessible proprioceptive cues. Now, you know, in musical performance, an adept pianist or a cellist enacts sensorimotorically multimodal procedures with exquisite speed and precision. In skilled tool use, the dexterity of the painter, musicianship, these all involve accruing and attuning subtle sensibilities of proprioception. I would say this process is iterative. And this is where there's a, um, a kind of um, flow between what have been regarded as separate categories in Gilbert Ryle's terms, between know-how and know-that or, if you like, in Andy Pickering's terms, between the performative and the representational. And this is an aspect of, of, of this conversation that I'm particularly interested in, is how skill, how embodied skilled practices become internalized to the point where they, where we can access them in, in more general ways. So more refined judgments are made and on the basis of those judgments we can make more refined actions. When we're learning to play a musical instrument, we go, oh that's a bit flat and that's because my finger is like this. So th there's a kind of iterative refinement of, of these bodily procedures which lead to more subtle kinds of sensing. And at some point, these things become concepts in a way. And this is what constitutes expertise. And one of the interesting things about expertise is that one of, one of the ways that we can uh, recognize expertise is that it has the ability to recognize expertise. So. So if I am an adept, let's say, welder, like, you know, someone can say, oh, there's a, that piece of steel there, you know, holding up that wall or roof or whatever it is, and 
And if I'm an adaptor, I go, well, it wasn't a very well executed weld, was it? I mean, it's a, you know, could it? So expertise provides us the ability to, to, um, to judge expertise. So know how becomes know that. And on that note, I will pause. Because I've already gone over time. And I'm very happy to uh, discuss these topics with you all. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So, you know, your yeah, body cognition, situated cognition, and been a lot of this stuff before. Think about the academy that we're in. It's kind of naturally divided into, like, we have the Faculty of Art, Design, and Architecture, which is the body practice faculty. We have, like, Department of IT, which is the more, um, the, the non bodily interaction. Uh -huh. Isn't it just that? They both work quite powerfully, and they both work quite well for the applications that people put them to. And that there's, you know, there's a role for each of them. And maybe just what are you thinking about that one? I was, I was thinking about what you were just saying, and I think the latest um, revelations in AI about the mm. knowledge that and knowledge how kind of actually reinforce that because. ChatGPT has lots of knowledge, in a sense, in the comments, right? And it's, it's learnt that knowledge, or, or we've put the guardrails around what we mean by learning and knowledge and things. It's learnt that without a body, without appropriate perception, without a kinesthetic sense, without any uh. of the senses that we have, it's just purely done it from the data. Uh -huh. And it's very good at um, certain things. But, but the thing is that ChatGPT lives in the realm of the representational. ChatGPT exactly, but that's the whole faculty that but, but, right, but ChatGPT knows nothing about the world. The, I'll but tell does you, it? Ah, indeed, it knows nothing about the world in the sense that it's not, it has no capacity to have an experience of the world. The only thing it has a capacity to do is to draw upon textual representations of qualities of the world, mm. whether it be you know, demographic so statistics. Reality is inaccessible to it, just like reality is inaccessible. Ah, no, I would say, I would dispute that. And I, what I want to say about ChatGPT, AI and machine learning in general, is that what we have to remember is that the vast amount of data that those systems draw upon have been put there by people. So people are the sensory end effectors of a cyborgian machine of which ChatGPT is just the kind of processor of, the, of information. If people had not tagged those images, and if we didn't have the machinery to, to tag those images in different sorts of ways, ChatGPT would have nothing to work with. Mm, that's, yeah, take that as given, but I, I don't think that changes the argument. Don't you? No. Oh. I'm playing the devil's advocate in something. No, no, it's good, it's good. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be... be Devilishly you know, advocated. I agree with you. Uh, yes, of course, it has no. It's it's. But I, you know, like, I use the scare quotes around knowledge because the knowledge that it has. Right. Is like Wikipedia has knowledge, right? Wikipedia has knowledge, but yeah, humans put the knowledge in there, and humans take the knowledge out. So it's not that Wikipedia actually has. Well, well, Wikipedia has data. It has information which has been organised by people. I don't think Wikipedia has knowledge. Wikipedia is a is an archive. It's a source of knowledge, a storage for knowledge. It, it's a source of records. Yeah. There's a question behind you, John. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to go back to your point about uh, all the data coming through, sort of us humans and how like, we're labeling and whatnot. But I just want to say, with, I'm pretty sure with ChatGPT, though, the data is, even though it's from us, yeah. it's from the internet, it's not labeled. It's not labeled. So we haven't labeled it. So it's actually just unsupervised training. So we haven't had to tell it, well, this is what the response should be. Or, or what. Can, can I, can I just say, I, I think within this framework, you can say it's statistically analyzing things that people have said, and those people 
clearly serving as some kind of breach between their kind of sensory experience of the world and the things that they write. And so it seems to me that what's, what chat GPT is missing is that bridging of those two things itself, but because it can produce uh, um, you know, some writing that, that plausibly reproduces what people say based on what people have previously said, that it will therefore more or less map onto human beings' understanding of the relationship between those two things. But I guess I would say that it's not supplying that itself. That's fine, what? Well, this note, the reason why it can say things that seem to plausibly refer to the world. things we understand in the yeah. world is because it's statistically analysing things that people have said and people conceptualise yeah, that. Yeah. So, so it's, it's not embodied, it, has, it doesn't know what the world yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, so no, I'm saying it's that human beings are kind of... But I'm saying, does it matter? matter? Why does it matter? <laughs> okay, I guess that's a different question. Yeah. But, I mean, I guess... Uh, I think we all agree on what it's not and how it gets its information. But I, what I'm asking is, why does it matter? Like, what does it matter that everyone who works in MARTA uses embodied skill and proper perception? And everyone, I mean, I know this is cliche, everyone in IT uses... No, it. no, I, I don't really think that's quite the question because, of course, one of the, you know, what we're trying to understand is what is the nature of human being? I'm not really concerned with, I mean, at other times I'll be concerned with discussing whether GPT knows anything or not. But what I'm really concerned about is the, how we define how it is that we know things and what we know, right? So, and, and, and clearly, even, uh, even when we're interacting with some virtual environment via the, this incredibly narrow and constrained interface, we're still embodied creatures doing those kinds of... A lot of the success of us as a species, yeah, like I, I, there's nothing controversial in what you say. A lot of the success of us as a species has not come from that. It's come from higher levels of non-representational thinking, like this is a body of mathematics. Um, our knowledge of the universe, of the physical world, all comes from the sciences. And they don't really need a lot of that. Oh, I'm yes, they do. Totally, totally, because because all of that knowledge is derived from... It's above. No, all of those, that knowledge is derived, obviously, that's science, right? That knowledge is derived from observation, about of, of, of reasoning upon this. observation. Because then there would be no role for theory. So theories are often theorised before the observed is observed. So the theory is actually telling you something about the world. True, that you true. Have you can't have a hypothesis without having a theory. And one of the things that we have discovered about those theoretical environments is sometimes they're profoundly mistaken. Sometimes you know? they're profoundly right. And true. true. But, so, okay, well, let's go back to, to, let's have some history of science here. You know, the heliocentric uh, versus geocentric solar system, you know, of, of, the, of the Reformation and the Inquisition. Um, the, the existence of, of the geocentric nature of our solar system, our, our position in our solar system, was established by reasoning on observations. You know, if you didn't have the observations, you couldn't do the reasoning. I, I think there's a very interesting question about, you know, where does, where does reasoning come from? Where, how do we get the capacity to reason? You know, that's, is it... That is that's sort of Right, but where do we get analogies? Yeah, of course, they're How do we in our physical body. Precisely, precisely, and so we. That at no, all. okay, yeah, all right. I'm just, I'm just. All I'm doing is just to provoke the argument. To, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just to say <clears throat> that, um, uh, like, I, I don't see a problem in that. Like, I, you know, I, 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 I think skill is fundamental. I think embodiment is fundamental for yeah. us as humans. There's no doubt about that. Ah, but, but you see, you're saying that, and so we agree. So but, I do agree, but, but you're saying but there is a kind of, but traditionally there is a kind of hierarchy of knowledge in the academy. Mm. You know, I mean, perhaps perhaps Monash is a, is a very enlightened kind of that's, academy. Yeah, that's more a political or a sociological aspect. Precisely, but it's a it's a sociological hierarchy that's rooted in a certain philosophical position, yeah. and that philosophical position so is fundamentally very successful. It has been successful. 
I mean, it's the reason why you're able to come here, right? You're able to come here and present, people are able to watch this on the internet because of that mode of thing. I'm not, I'm not a super advocate for the current status quo or anything like that, but I do think it's often a thing that it's, it's like an either or. It's either, you know, this, either this way or that way. But I think you've got to look at the positive aspects of both. And well, I don't even want to binarize. You know, I mean, that's the thing, is I'm working against establishing sort of, sort of exclusive binaries. They're not exclusive. They're continuing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But the, but the, I mean, they are, there is a separation between the kinds of things that you're talking about in terms of embodiment. And, I mean, they're, they're often very ephemeral, but um, the kinds of modes of thinking that have led to discoveries about things. I mean, think about Einstein's theories about the, um, you know, sub part of things that we right. can't have any direct experience about, like right. mechanics and that kind right. of Right. But all of that is theory, right? Because ah, but yes and no. I mean, let's not forget that you know, when Einstein talked about developing his theory of relativity, he said two interesting things. First of all, the analogy he used was sitting on a train uh, with a train pulling out next to him and, and the relativity of not knowing if you were moving or the other train was moving. Yeah. And secondly, he said that he couldn't have come up with the theory of relativity if he hadn't been a small boat sailor. So, so what I'm interested in is, is this kind of the, the uh, sort of the how that the, these things that you're calling abstract knowledge and that we we uh, typically refer to as abstract knowledge, the notion that that corpus of knowing is somehow separated from embodied being is, I think, a mistake of Enlightenment philosophy that we still haven't fully. It's not separate. It comes from. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But exactly. Yeah, but it's still useful. I'm not saying it's not useful. Of course, I'm using it all the time. <laughs> we agree. <laughs> we agree. Let someone else ask Yeah. Is there any, anything coming in online? No, I think they they join through YouTube. Oh. I had a more fine-grained question if you want this. Lovely. Um, I'm just, I guess, wondering about the kind of more particular kind of mechanics of your uh, sort of association for perception and, and skill bit. Mm. So what I'm wondering is, um, uh, let, let's say someone is becoming a kind of skilled concert violinist, mm -hmm. uh, and through that process, their, um, their kind of proprioception, I guess other kinds of tactile responses are becoming more and more finely tuned mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, kind mm -hmm. of uh, focused on a set of sensitivities that will allow mm -hmm. them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, they, they can, um, you know, they can make these kind of very small, say, physical adjustments to hit just the right note and get just the right timbre and all those kinds of things. What what is the process kind of after that, if you like, or, or by which that person then hits the perfect note, gets the perfect sound every time without feedback? Does that make sense? Like, the, isn't there a kind of a point where it, it turns over from being able it's to... Awesome memory. Is it it's awesome memory. You've done it so many times, you've trained your body to move to that exact position, and you do that unconsciously. But isn't but isn't there but isn't there a level at which there still will always be some slight difference in the circumstances? Mm. That's the precision of the human. Totally. No, I think I think that. But say I know I I would imagine I'm not a concert violinist, but I could imagine I know temperature and humidity probably. Right. Not Clearly, or or or, or the or the sweat on your fingers, or the quality yeah. of the rosin on the bow, yeah. or so those things are constantly varying. Exactly reproducing the same thing. The cognition is happening not just in your brain; it's happening. in and muscles and things, and it's accommodating that. Well, that probably in general terms, that's right. I guess I'm asking Simon to what, what's your what's your feeling of exactly how that works? In that, I guess if, if you're focusing on the proprioception, is there a kind of step? Well, it's not well, well, after the proprioception, but where something else is also no, kind of because because you know, according to a kind of um, an active understanding of how we make our way in the world, we always have to think about uh, not separating um, uh, sensing and, and motor actions. That, 
the word sensory motoric or sensory motor is really profoundly meaningful that there can be no sensing without action and there can be no action without sensing so we even to the finest sort of millisecond level every action is modulated at the speed at which our nervous system functions so yes I agree with you entirely um, the, Tim Ingold has a lovely essay called Walking the Plank where he talks about sawing a plank of wood with a handsaw and makes the argument that every single saw, even though this appears to be a repetitive function, right, every single thrust of the saw is different and is judged and articulated with relation to the previous one and in relation to the, you know, the process of making that cut and in relation to the point you are in cutting through the board and so on and so on. So there is no repetition. I think that's really, you know, that kind of addresses, you know, what you're saying. That, that, that being in the world and, and virtuosic or expertise being in the world is always this kind of vir, um, virtuosic improvisation. Yeah. I guess what, what I'm interested in, or, or what, what um, I mean, we were kind of talking around this earlier today, but, but what I think is the kind of mystery there is, I guess, if we imagine hypothetically someone learning to play the violin, there's a point at which they're kind of thinking, oh, I've made a mistake, or that sound uh, is, uh, is wrong, yeah. and then how do I make that adjustment? And right. to a point where it's right. both kind of too, so rapid and also so kind of outside conscious thinking. Well, this is this is about this is about learning and about the sort of neurophysiology of learning, and I just read something quite interesting about that. But so so you know, as we know, right, and as Hubert Dreyfus argued long ago, right, the accruing of skill is not the accruing of increasingly refined rules, right? The the we only use rules in the kind of elementary process of the processes of learning something, whether it be learning to play football or, you know, or, or go sailing or whatever, until there's a kind of bodily internalization of the complexities of the experience, at which point following the rules is, is, is going to be an impediment. So what does that mean that, 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 I mean, the point at which you feel unskilled is the point at which you don't have to enumerate procedures and rules. And that probably reflects the laying down of new neural pathways. So I was reading a, a, reading a thing about, what was it, a guy was doing a study of braille learners. And there was a very interesting uh, change in people's aptitude. So he w looking at those people who were studying braille five days a week for over a year. And, and in the learning process, he found that people's ability to, to practice Braille I increased over the working week to a peak on the Friday. On the Monday, it had fallen back to a base level. So there would familiarity, and then the weekend, they'd f kind of forget. But that base level slowly also climbed. And the argument was that the, the kind of instant, the, the sort of daily repetition curve was a result of uh, utilization of existing neural pathways and the slow incremental increase in the baseline was a result of building new neural pathways and that process takes months and then they went away on vacation they came back and the, the capacity had not dropped right so that that was preserved because it's like preserved in neural tissue and I think this really kind of um, is an interesting, interesting way to think about traditional notions of, you know, learning skills, right? Whether, whether it's martial arts or, or playing music, there's this emphasis on repetition and practice. Well, there's a neurological reason why, why that really makes sense. Uh, but that, so that, that then is adding something to the proprioception. It's changing. Well, you know, as we were saying earlier, I mean, it's not, I mean, I, I don't. I want to talk about proprioception as a as a sensory capacity, um, but that whole process, the, the the larger process of skill, is a sort of multimodal sensory motoric 
phenomenon in which different sensory modalities are integrated in a more complex way. Yeah, and, and like ha how I'm integrating proprioception with vision, with, uh, with actual precise motor functions um, is what constitutes the skill. Yeah. yeah. And where that lives in the body, we don't know. <laughs> Is that good then? I've been you thinking about the same thing. Um, so uh, just continuing on that, uh, you've used the practice of the violin is practicing and becoming better. So the last phrase that you had on your talk, I've been staring at this for a while. Um, I'm really quite interested in seeing it as an iterative process mm -hmm. where these, these cues become something that you actually become aware of. But I was wondering if there's another step of becoming aware of it then forgetting about them. Yeah. Um, so so that maybe that's what you meant too with this is an iterative process where where this wanders back into pre appropriate yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if if it is the entire pipeline or if there is another step of after you become aware of something, you deal with it, you learn how to do it, you learn how to how to hold something, uh. how, to, how much pressure to put uh. on something on, on, a, um, on an instrument, um, to then just stop thinking about it at all and it, it wanders back into something that yes. you do it intuitively. Right, totally, totally. I, I, and I think this, you know, I think that's what we've been talking about is, is, is uh, you know, in the case of proprioception, or the argument I'm making about proprioception, say, you know, we, as we come, as we come to understand what a certain task is, whether it be some move in yoga or, or, or playing the violin, um, we bring what was previously not available to consciousness in terms of, you know, our, our ability to do certain things. It comes into consciousness. We become aware that we have that capacity. We come a, be aware that we can sense those kinds of things that perhaps we've never thought about sensing before. And then again, yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. That's part of the learning process. And then that more complex, what would that be? A kind of more pro complex sensory motoric integration then slips away from consciousness again and just becomes part of the you know procedure that you that you enact it's fascinating isn't it yeah it also ties into uh, discussions that i had about skill or um, um, this this notion of somebody being a genius somebody being just incredibly good at something out of nowhere Mm. This incredible football player, an incredible musician, and I don't think that really exists. Um, it's just that this guy started kicking around the ball at the age of three, and and he has this this muscle memory and, and, and all these cues just internalized on a level that it, it's not that he's not even aware of it anymore. Um, so I, I guess in, in this area. We talk a lot about skills, and, and a lot of us have uh, practical steps in their, in their practice of what they do. Um, and yeah, I, I'm always fascinated by, by this, by this um, idea of how, how, do you, how you're actually good at something. Yeah. Um, practice. Yeah. In the end, that's, that's all. But, but, I, but also, I was. We, we, we want to believe in this idea of somebody being a genius, like most of being this genius. It's, it's been pretty much disproven. Yeah. Um, but, but that's not to say that people don't have special abilities. Mm -hmm. We're all genetically different, right? Precisely. So we all have different capabilities that are possible because of our genes. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't guarantee you're going to be a genius. Like, you know, if you're Einstein's children, you're not going to necessarily. To do what Einstein did. There's a correlation between parental traits and the traits of the children. But also, there's a famous story of a, I think it's a Russian family who 
um, got their children playing chess from a very, very early age and had no interest in it all, but they forced them to play. Mm. And they became grandmasters quite at an early age just because they'd done it since they were kids, their brain. It is the right, thing about right, right. neuroplasticity. Gr 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 grow the yeah. neural structures. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like the, if you've read the Anil Seth book, one, um, where he talks a lot about all these kinds of things about how people become virtuosos and how people become geniuses and geniuses. It's just, uh, and most of it is just practice. And and some, I mean, look, you know, speaking from personal experience, I became a sculptor. I, I, you know, I had reading disabilities as a child. I'm a bit dyslexic, but I didn't wasn't aware that I have really good 3D visualization capabilities. And what a surprise! I, I gravitated towards sculpture, not towards writing. So yeah, people do have, and and some of these capacities that lead to, you know, sort of skills or or even, you know virtuosity. They're not necessarily things that we have traditionally measured in, in conventional tests of intelligence and so on. You know, there, people have a multifarious range of capabilities. Dan and I were just talking about olfactory memory. Turns out some peak people can bring sense to mind in a really you know, clear way and some people not very good at that. And maybe the people who can do that, they become uh, Somalias and 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 you know designing fragrances. <laughs> and also, I guess what what you're talking about here is illustrating the fact that even if someone is very good at something, that doesn't necessarily bring any insight into why or how they're good at that thing. Like it's not you just reflecting on the fact that your concert violinist weren't necessarily mean that you have an understanding of precisely what is responsible for that. And so I guess that's where things like genius and so on can come in, is that even even the person themselves might not have a good conceptualization of the actual things that make that happen. And that, that gives a kind of mysticism to the whole thing. Well, they might be able to verbalize it. And, and so to different degrees. Well, I mean, that, that even like, you know, like, what, what am I doing when I... Yeah, they might like to verbalise it. Yeah, but they, even, might but know, even they know what they're doing, obviously. Well, but I mean, that, but maybe not kind of consciously. Like they, well, no, you because, you know, like if you're a virtuoso penis, for instance, it's known that the movement of your fingers is faster mm. than the neural signals can travel to your brain. Yeah. So you're not thinking about it in the brain sense of thinking. It's not conscious, you're consciously aware of it, and your body is able to do it. Right, and that's because you've just done it so many times that you've, and it's the, you know, you've grown these neural pathways that have reinforced that. Uh. So to explain that linguistically is sort of nonsensical in a way. Because how can you explain something? Right, but also, you know, I mean, that's that's the question where our conventional sense of, of talking about ourselves as a brain and a body gets in the way, mm. because you know, if we if we want to say, well. Why can't I have knowledge in my hands? You know, why is it? You know, where does knowledge reside? If we think of it in a holistic sense of the neurophysiology of the person, then then this conventional notion that certain kinds of operations happen inside the skull, I mean, in case of proprioception, it makes no sense. Case in point, right? Um, we. There are two different ways of explaining the fact that I can do that, right? One of them is that I have in my brain a model of my body, and that's constantly updated by my nerve endings, which tell me approximately where my fingertips are in space, and so I kind of constantly iterate on that equation and bring them roughly together. But what if there is no model of the body in the brain? What if that's a fiction of, of sort of late enlightenment neurological thinking? What if the body is the model? You know, to paraphrase Rodney Brooks, right? Famously said, the world is its own best model. Robots don't need to make models of the world. Well, maybe the body is its own best model. So if you accept that, then you have to assume that stuff we have previously assigned to cranial operations are dispersed through the body in a, in a different way. Which is, you know, it's like challenging, right? Because that's, that's disrupting of... I think that's of a controversial view these days. 
don't you? But that's because you know you're very progressive. I think for a lot of people, <laughs> it is a controversial idea. Yeah, maybe some will stick in the mud. Yeah, some will stick in the mud. <laughs> I, I, I Propose that we go and eat some lunch. Over lunch. Thank you so Sorry. much. I have one final thing to say, which is they have some very good water-based paints now. Ah, oh, <laughs> no, I can't go there. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bit of a tradition.